Hello, welcome back Space Cadets. I'm Jason and today we're tackling a question that's been hurling through the minds of scientists, politician, and actually anyone who's ever watched a disaster movie. Could we actually deflect an incoming asteroid from hitting the Earth? Now, before you start stockpiling canned goods and building underground bunkers, let's all take a deep breath and remember that asteroid impacts are incredibly rare. You're actually more likely to be struck by lightning while winning the lottery than you are to experience a civilization ending impact. But hey, there's an old saying that I like to say, and that is that the dinosaurs would still be around if they had a space program. So strap in and get ready for a journey through time and space and some seriously big rocks as we explore the fascinating world of asteroid deflection. Now let's start by talking about what these cosmic projectiles are actually made of. Asteroids are essentially space rocks, but their composition can vary quite a bit. Most asteroids fall into three main categories. The first type is called the C-type asteroid. Those are the carbonaceous asteroids, which are dark and they make up about 75% of known asteroids. Next, there are the S-type asteroids. Those are called the silicaceous, which are bright and they make up about 17%. And then finally, the M-type, the metallic asteroids, which are very rare. Now, these C-type asteroids, the most common ones, they're most commonly composed of clay and silicate rocks. The S-type asteroids are made up mostly of silicate materials and also some nickel and iron. And the M-type asteroids are mostly nickel iron in their entirety. Some asteroids might also actually contain things like gold, valuable metals like platinum and other rare earth elements, which has led to interest in potential asteroid mining in the far future. Basically, asteroids are really hard and when they hit the earth, they're gonna hurt. All right, now before we dive into the hows and the whys of asteroid deflection, let's take a quick trip down memory lane and look at some of the most significant impacts that Earth has actually experienced in the past. Because believe it or not, our planet has been playing cosmic dodgeball for billions of years. All right, let's first start with the granddaddy of them all, the Chicxulub impact. This is near the Yucatan Peninsula, modern day Yucatan. This is the one that bid farewell to our reptilian overlords, the dinosaurs, about 66 million years ago. The asteroid that caused that impact is estimated to be between 10 and 15 kilometers in diameter. That's roughly the size of Mount Everest in size. Now, the energy released by this impact was equivalent to about 100 million megatons of TNT. Not 100 million tons, 100 million megatons of TNT. Now, to put that in perspective, the largest nuclear bomb ever detonated, called the Tsar Bomba, had a yield of about 50 megatons. So we're talking about an explosion about 2 million times more powerful than the biggest nuke we've ever detonated. Now, of course, when an asteroid like this hits the ground, it vaporizes and wipes out everything in the immediate vicinity, but how does it actually destroy all the life on the planet, or most of the life? What's really going on is it throws a lot of dust and dirt into the atmosphere. And what you should do when you have time one day is look at volcanic eruptions, especially from space. Even today, volcanoes erupt and throw an enormous amount of material into the atmosphere that circulates around the globe. So when an asteroid hits, it's throwing millions of times more material into the atmosphere. And what it does when it throws this material into the atmosphere is it begins to block out the sunlight. And so that cools down the planet, but it also interrupts the food chain. The plants can't grow, so the little critters can't eat the plants. And then so the big critters cannot eat the little critters. And over time, things begin to die. Now, all of this is so surprising that it can occur from the impact of something the size of 10 to 15 kilometers, the Earth is thousands of kilometers across. So how can something 10 to 15 kilometers actually do that? And the answer is they're traveling really fast. 19 kilometers per second is the estimated impact velocity of that impactor. Think about a kilometer. Think about driving a kilometer in a car and think about traveling 19 kilometers every second. And then think about a rock the size of Mount Everest traveling that fast. When it hits the ground, our human brains can really not imagine the amount of energy stored in that velocity of an impactor like that. So even though 10 to 15 kilometers doesn't 
doesn't seem like so much. It's traveling at 19 kilometers per second. And so that's an incredible amount of energy on impact. Now, before we start planning our heroic mission to save the Earth, we need to know what we're really up against here. So let's talk about the big, bad planet killers, the asteroids large enough to cause global catastrophe, right? Generally speaking, astronomers consider asteroids larger than somewhere around the order of one kilometer in diameter to be a potential planet killer. An impact from an object this size would cause worldwide climate effects, potentially leading to the collapse of global agriculture and a widespread famine. But there's always good news, so here's some good news. We've already found about 95% of these near-Earth objects, or NEOs as NASA scientists tend to call them, and none of them pose a significant risk in the near future. So that's the little bit of good news. However, smaller asteroids can still pack a punch. Objects even as small as about 140 meters across could cause regional devastation if they hit a populated area. And we've only found about 40% of these smaller but still dangerous near-Earth objects. So how far out do we need to spot these things to have a chance at deflecting them and avoiding the chaos of an impact? Well, it kind of depends on the size of the asteroid and the method that we choose to try and deflect it. But in general, the more warning time, the better chance of survival that we'll have. Ideally, we want to detect a potential hazardous asteroid years and maybe even decades in the future before a potential impact. And this would give us time to study the object, determine its composition, determine its exact trajectory, its impact point, and plan and execute a deflection mission. The absolute minimum time we probably need realistically is about five to 10 years heads up. But more time is always better when you're trying to change the course of a hurling rock through space. Now let's talk about this for just a second. You know about angles, right? So we have small angles right here, and then we have uh, you know smaller angles, and then we have larger angles, 90 degree angles, and so on, okay? So if we are talking about a relatively small angle, it's, it's going to be much easier to deflect something. And I'm gonna talk about the methods in a second on how it's done but it's going to be much easier to deflect something that size a tiny, tiny bit, a tiny, tiny angle, in other words. So instead of trying to, to hit it when it gets close to us, like as close as the moon, that's gonna be almost impossible. What's really better is if we can detect it way out beyond the orbit of Mars, so we have maybe 10 years. Then we only have to do a very tiny deflection, and over its travel distance to Earth, a tiny angle can add up into a very large uh, deflection or a miss from the orbit of the Earth. Think about a tiny one degree angle. When you look at the tips of my, of my fingertips, they're pretty close together. But if you extend this, I'll try to do it with my hands, extend this one degree angle out and out and out and out, you see my fingertips are getting farther apart. And if you extend this one degree angle out, you know, millions and millions of kilometers in the, uh, across the solar system, then that tiny one degree deflection that you can achieve turns into big, big deflection in kilometers way down the line. So a difference between one year heads up and a five year heads up and a 10 year heads up is absolutely critical. And that's why we have these deep sky surveys looking for these near Earth asteroids. So we've detected most of the big ones, but the small ones are harder and harder to detect, right? And so the bigger heads up, the more time we have, have, the better chance we're going to have of survival. Now, scientists and engineers have come up with several potential methods to actually deflect these asteroids. Some sound like they're straight out of a science fiction movie, while others are a little bit easier to swallow. So what I'd like to start off with is let's talk about the most cinematic option, nuking the asteroid. That's what most people think about, right? Now, before you start celebrating as if we have this like in the bag already fixed up and we know what to do, it's important to note that most scientists don't actually consider this to be the best option. The main reason is blowing up an asteroid, literally trying to destroy it, could actually create uh, multiple smaller asteroids, turning one big problem into thousands of smaller problems. I'd like to chat about this for a second. Basically, if we try to blow up an asteroid, we don't know what's going to happen. It's possible that the giant asteroid will just split into two fragments. And then you have, instead of one 
you know, 15 kilometer uh, asteroid. Maybe you have two seven and a half kilometer asteroids, and those could still be almost planet wide devastators on their own, right? Um, but it's possible that it could turn it into a thousand, you know, multi hundred meters uh, 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 objects like this. Or it's possible that it could like turn it into like tiny, tiny, tiny little rocks, right? We don't really have experience with blowing up rocks in space with nuclear weapons, so we don't really know what it'll do, right? If it, it really could vaporize it into almost like dust particles, then when it hits the atmosphere, it would burn up like normal meteors and it would be okay. The problem is it's much more likely based on simulations to actually create a thousand objects that are all individually really, really hard to handle and can cause lots of devastation. So whereas one object hitting the ocean would be really bad, maybe you have a smaller 500 meter object hit New York City and another 300 meter object hit Atlanta and another whatever, something else hit uh, uh, Paris, and then you have all this devastation all over the planet. So blowing it up, because it's so unpredictable in exactly what it's going to do, it's actually not the preferred option. However, nuclear devices could still play a role in asteroid deflection. Instead of trying to actually blow it up, what we could do is try to detonate a nuke near, but not on, the surface of an asteroid. So an explosion near the surface would actually vaporize part of the surface of the asteroid, creating a jet of material which would push the asteroid off course. It's kind of like a cosmic leaf blower just trying to gently nudge it in a new direction. But let's move on to some other least explosive options. One of the most promising methods is called a kinetic impact. It's a similar idea, but it involves a spacecraft, instead of blowing up, just smashing into the asteroid at high velocity. Not to blow it up, but just to try to change its trajectory very slightly. It's basically like playing billiards or pool in space with the Earth's safety as the stakes. In fact, NASA has already actually tested this method with a mission that they launched in 2022 called the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or the DART mission. So in September 2022, DART successfully impacted the asteroid Dimorphos, changing its orbit around the larger companion Didymos. Now this was humanity's first attempt at moving a celestial body, but believe it or not, it actually worked. This was an absolutely amazing mission because, you know, with a nuclear weapon, you can kind of get close and blow it up and do something, right? But with this DART mission, they had to actually hit the asteroid, which was a small asteroid to begin with. Again, the goal is not to blow it up. The goal is to transfer kinetic energy. It's why it's called a kinetic impactor into the asteroid, very slightly changing its course. Again, if you can do this halfway across the solar system, a tiny one degree shift in its trajectory could make it miss Earth completely. If you try to do this when it's like near the moon or something, you're not going to have time and it's not going to do anything. So this uh, mission was very successful because not only were we able to hit the object, we were able to measure all kinds of things. How much material did the impact actually blow off? How far did the trajectory shift, and they're still monitoring this. And they actually figured out that they were able to shift the trajectory of this object a little bit more than they were calculating ahead of time. Of course, it depends on what the object's made of, what, you know, if it's metal, if it's rock, whatever. And that's why we have to have a survey of things to know what types of objects are out there and what they're made of. Another intriguing method is called a gravity tractor. So this involves parking a heavy spacecraft with a lot of mass near the asteroid and using tiny gravitational attraction between the two bodies, it pulls the asteroid off course. It's a really slow process, but it doesn't require any direct contact between the asteroid and the spacecraft. There are other concepts out there that sound crazy, but potentially could actually work. One concept is to build very powerful space lasers, build them either in orbit or build them on the surface of the moon. And what you do is if you know where the asteroid is, you point your laser at that uh, object and you have a multi megawatt laser or something even bigger. And you, since a laser beam is very tight and very focused, you're able to hit the object with a laser beam. But you're not trying to blow it up like a Death Star or Star Wars or anything. What you're trying to do is just heat up one side of the object. So if the object is over here, maybe you only attempt to, to heat up one side of it. It, it. it very slowly vaporizes and heats up one side, and that can create material to come off almost like a rocket thruster and push the object very gently off course. As you might guess, this is tough to do because building lasers that powerful is number one, very difficult to do even on Earth, and number two, 100,000 times more difficult to build them in space or on the moon. So it's possible in the future we could have defense systems with lasers like this, but we're just not at that technology level yet. 
Now for smaller asteroids, we might even be able to use concentrated sunlight to do the same thing and to change the course. By focusing sunlight on one part of the asteroid's surface, we could do the same thing. We could heat it up, cause it to eject material, and alter its course. That would be kind of like using the world's biggest magnifying glass for planetary defense. Now these all sound great in theory, but what would we actually do in real life if we actually spotted a hazardous asteroid tomorrow heading our way? Well, step one would be to gather more data. We have to know what we're dealing with. We would use ground-based assets and space-based telescopes to observe the asteroid, determine its exact trajectory, its rotation rate, estimate its size, and estimate its composition. This information will be crucial to plan any actual deflection attempt. Now, if we had enough warning time, remember we really want at least five or 10 years, we would very likely opt for the kinetic impactor similar to the DART mission that we've already tested. This has the advantage of being relatively simple and proven to work, so we know that we have something known that could work. We would then build a spacecraft, probably build a few different spacecraft for redundancy, launch it towards an intercept course with that asteroid, cross our fingers as it smashes into the rock at high speed, and then we would watch and wait with telescopes and measure the change in the asteroid's trajectory, recalculating its impact point. And if the kinetic impact wasn't enough, or if we had less warning time, we might consider using a nuclear device as a last resort. But that would be a very complex international decision with a lot of potential consequences consequences you have to really think about. In any case, we continue to track the asteroid very closely, ready to evacuate any areas at risk if our deflection attempts were not successful at all. It's always good to have a backup plan. Unfortunately, if it's years away, it's going to be very difficult to predict exactly where the impact point will be with any accuracy. So there you have it in a nutshell. While the idea of an incoming asteroid might sound like the plot of a summer movie, the reality is that scientists and engineers around the world are already hard at work to try to make sure we're prepared for such an event. From kinetic impacts to gravity tractors, from nuclear devices to giant space magnifying glasses or lasers, humanity has come up with some pretty cool ideas to potentially save our planet from a catastrophe. But perhaps the most important tool in our planetary defense arsenal is actually just vigilance. And what I mean by that is the more that we observe and understand these near-Earth objects, the better prepared we'll be if one ever actually comes our way. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there's an old saying, the dinosaurs would still be around today if they had a space program. So it's very important to devote a small amount of money to searching the sky for potential threats. So the next time you look up at the night sky, I really want you to remember that those twinkling stars aren't just beautiful, they're a reminder that we are just a tiny, tiny part in a vast and dynamic universe. And thanks to our ingenuity and our determination and our grit, we're not just passive observers of the universe anymore. We're active participants ready to step up and protect our home if the need arises. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I'm Jason. Please drop me a line. I always read every comment and I invite you as you walk under the stars at night, always remember to stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.